Oh, sorry. Thank you. Can you guys hear me okay in the back? Good? Good? Okay. Better? Okay. I'll try to talk loud. I'm slowly losing my voice. I've been talking too much, so I apologize for that. But if you can't hear me, just, just give me the, the thumbs up to speak louder. Uh, so, a brief introduction. Hopefully everyone's here for the Southeast Area Conversion Project for Septic to Sewer. My name is Randy Rice. I'm the City Engineer. I'm going to introduce a few of our staff here in the back. Um, Eric Davis, he's with uh, Far West Engineering. He's our project engineer, one of the designers for the project. Uh, Dan Stuckey over there in the back, he's our public, Deputy Public Works Director. Darren Anderson is the project manager here for the city with Public Works. I also have Andy Hummel, who is our wastewater utility uh, manager, and Keith Karpstein, who is our uh, project manager and senior engineer with Far West, who is our consultant on the project, helping us uh, navigate some of the design challenges that we find when we go into these projects. And by the way, um, if you have any questions, let's go ahead and wait till the end. I'm hoping that most of the information in this presentation will answer a lot of the questions. Um, I know I've seen a number of familiar faces. I've had emails and phone calls with a few of you in this room. So if you've, you've uh, contacted us, thank you very much for your concerns. We certainly appreciate and, uh, and, and appreciate your information coming in. So a brief purpose and need of the project. So why are we here? Um, we have a couple of wells. A number of those wells uh, have nitrate contaminants that have exceeded the threshold. Um, they've, they've exceeded 10, which is the recommended limit for drinking. Once you get into the 10 milliliter uh, per uh, gram per milliliter uh, area, what happens is you, you can have detrimental health effects from drinking that water. The studies that we found so far are leading to the fact that they are from a dense area with septic in the area, right? So when you leach septic into the ground, it can reach the aquifer, uh, and that can cause problems for, for drinking water. Right now we have two wells. Well 38 is not in operation. We took that down in 2019 because the, the threshold of that has exceeded the regulatory threshold. And so what happens is we have to test that well every single week. And it's very time consuming and taxing on staff resources to go out there and do that. And so we've actually pulled that well offline. Um, it takes a lot of water waste to get that well to be under the threshold. And of course we want to look out for all of your uh, health needs and so that well unfortunately has been taken offline we also have another well well 43 that's currently in operation but is in jeopardy of being taken offline because of the the nitrates being found and tested in that uh, we've had a number of studies that have been done in the past and that they have shown or they've hinted that septic is the most likely culprit um, i know i've had a lot of questions and concerns that say can you guarantee it can you verify it What's underneath us is very complicated. The hydrogeology, which means the, the subsurface water, the aquifers below us, they're very complicated. Um, it takes a lot of study, it takes a lot of money to perfect those studies. What we do know is that the likelihood of that being the case, septics being the problem, the nitrates in the area, is very likely, right? And this isn't something that's happening just in Carson City, this is happening all over the United States. Um, it's a well-documented fact. Um, you can go online and find, um, e even back three, four, five hundred years ago, there are a number of towns that have been abandoned simply because they, they put their uh, disposal, their waste disposal sites too close to their drinking water supplies. Um, and so we want to avoid that. And so that's kind of the purpose uh, of this project. So again, um, back, in the, back in the late 80s, early 90s, there were a number of studies. NDEP was involved looking at um, the wellhead protection program. They identified two areas in Carson City that needed to be remediated. So the first one was the uh, New Empire area, and the second one is the area we're gonna be talking about tonight, which is the southeast area part of Carson City. Uh, we also did a follow-up study in 1994, I believe that was Vector Engineering, who looked at all potential uh, possible areas for the contamination. They looked at agricultural, um, they looked at you know, surface water precipitation, uh, point and non-point solution sources, and essentially all of the engineering studies up to this point have led to uh, septic being the, the concern. In 1995, the Board of Supervisors established a waiver program that would allow uh, municipal sewer to be brought into the city, or to the, to the area, and uh, waive connection fees as part of that, that waiver and provide some guidelines as to what that looks like. We're essentially working off the same resolution or similar or similar uh, features. So if you were part of that project or if you're familiar with that, many of those components are still the same, right? 
right? And we can talk about that more afterwards. Uh, but really, there's no surprises here. We're trying to be as open and transparent with you all as we can be so that you don't have any surprises when we do come into the area and know exactly what to expect, uh, what you're going to be responsible for, and we'll go over that here in just a moment. Uh, but again, we want to be open here. We're here for you. Um, I've had a number of callers concerned that um, the last time this project happened, uh, Maybe the, prog the progress of the project had gone too far along too quickly and the public didn't have a chance to, to voice their concerns. Well, I just want to ensure and inform all of you that that's not the case here. We are very early in the project. We're probably about the 15% design. Most of the things you see today are very conceptual. That nothing's been set in stone. We still have plenty of investigative work to do. We need to come out to your properties. We need to talk to you all individually. Uh, we'll talk about that process here again in, in a moment. Uh, but, but rest assured, we're here for you. This meeting is for you so that you can tell us you know, what's good about the project, what's bad about the project. Uh, we're here to take your concerns tonight. So a little bit about the project phasing. This is a picture of the Southeast Area Sewer. Uh, we've had 12 phases. Uh, I think nine of those have been completed so far. There are three that are outstanding. Phases 9, 10, and 11. So those are notated in this kind of crosshatch pattern here on the side. So this is the area right now that we're going to be talking about. The yellow is phase 9, and the pink is phase 10. To make things a little bit confusing, we have combined those phases and then broke them down into three zones. Those are the three zones you've probably seen if you, if you got the packet earlier in the mail. Hopefully everyone here tonight that's a resident or a concerned citizen has seen this packet in the mail. I see a couple of head nods, good. So this map that you've seen here, these are the three zones that we're going to be talking about. So I apologize if that's confusing, but a lot of that's to break up uh, the design of the sewer system and the way things flow. And so that made a little bit more sense to us to break that up. Um, so that's why there's a difference between the, the old project phasing and currently what we're talking about right now. So a little bit about project significance. Um, we talked about the two wells. They are continuing to t trend upwards in nitrates. Uh, so that means every time we sample the well, the, the amount of nitrates that uh, we are receiving from those tests, they continue to rise upward. And so we want to eliminate or, or at least decrease that trend. Um, we've talked about the, the uh, nitrates as a health concern. A little bit about funding. So we've had uh, some opportunities to go after some grant money. We've got $2 million coming in from federal government assistance. One million of that is from ARPA, which is federal relief money. And the other million dollars is from a federal earmark that we got. So a lot of those grants, I know I've talked to a few of you, they're very competitive. It takes a lot of work to go after those grants. So staff have put a lot of time and resources into trying to go after that to keep the project costs down. Um, unfortunately, those were the only two that were able to secure at this time. We will continue to work with some of our partners to continue to get more grants. And of course, if we get more money to the project, even better for us, right? We can lower the cost uh, and make sure this, this project is sustainable. Um, and of course, we, we've talked a little bit about the concerns, but the goal is to, to correct uh, the, the problem, which is the rise of nitrates. And we, the best way to do that is to eliminate the source, right? And if, so if signs are pointing towards the septic systems, the best way to treat and, and have a significant outcome in this process is to eliminate the source. Uh, you, uh, many of you have had comments um, over email and phone calls I've had with a number of you and the project staff has had with you. Um, is, are there other options? Yes, there are other options. We've looked at uh, denitrification systems. Those systems are very expensive. They require us to basically do work on, on private lots and those systems are, we can't really regulate them. So we could spend a bunch of money putting those systems in, and there's no way for us to guarantee that the systems are going to be maintained, the systems are being regularly tested, and that they're working. So it's, it's very intensive for staff to develop a program to do that. Um, and again, those systems which were, um, I think, questionably effective back you know, 20, 30 years ago, um, there's still some concern of whether or not those systems are effective. The ones that we have reached out and looked into are very expensive in the, in the order of magnitude of $50,000 per home. Um, and so, again, I just want you all to know that we've worked very hard to look at all options. All of our options are still open. Again, we're, we're happy to hear from all of you about what your concerns about your specific property. But I just want you all to know that staff have put a, a number of hours and time into looking into this. The best way to make this work for all of us, right, is we're a team. I think, you know, the residents in the city and the project staff as well as Public Works, we're all a team to get this done and get this done right. So. Um, I guess the point of that message is please, 
If you have concerns, let us know, but we've, we've really looked at every avenue, and we'll continue to look down every avenue until we've, we've turned over every rock we feel like we can. All right, so we've talked about the three phases <coughs> here so you can all see. This green phase right here between Snyder, Conti, Gentry, and Hudson, this is the first zone that we're looking at doing the design and construction on. The blue zone here, we're gonna continue to work on design, so that's why it's important for us to meet with a number of you all to talk about you know, the features of your home and how we can connect to the sewer. The reason this is important is because many of those grant programs that we have they require shovel-ready projects, or they get higher ratings for shovel-ready projects. So that means if we go through with the design of this project, we can limit disturbance to you all, the residents, right, with our with our activities, which I'm sure you all appreciate, not, not knocking on your door, you know, every five years and asking you what's going on. But also because it, it gives us more opportunities to go after more money. And so if we have more money in our coffers to help support the project, then less burden on you as the resident to connect it and to find up your suit. Then we also have Heidi Circle here in red. This will be a future phase. Uh, we don't have money secured for the blue or the red phases that you're seeing here. Uh, but again, those are the differentiations between the colors, so if you're wondering what those mean. Okay, with that, I'm gonna turn it over quickly to our consultant, Keith, and uh, he'll, he'll talk about the next steps. Yep, yep. Thank you, Randy. So now that Randy talked about the why, I'm gonna talk about the what. You know, what, what the project's actually gonna include. So, obviously we're gonna be constructing sewer mains within all the roads in the neighborhood. And those are depicted better on these exhibits we have over here on the boards. We don't have any of those in the, the slide presentation. So we're constructing sewer mains in the streets. Um, here's kind of an example of what's gonna happen in front of your property. So we're gonna be placing a sewer lateral from the sewer main to the property line with a clean out at the property line for future connection by residents. Now, it'll also be pavement patch in the street. In some areas, we're gonna be pretty deep, which means probably a full width of pavement replacement, which might be a good thing, um, you know, to get yeah. new pavement. <laughs> Um, but uh, that's essentially a, a quick overview of what the project's going to involve. Now here's just a, a plan view of the same concept that I just talked about, the sewer lateral going to the property line. You can see we're showing that, you know, this is just a generic example of what uh, the septic systems typically look like on your property. They're at the back of the lot, we'll have to connect to that lateral coming out of your home and then down and uh, out to the street. Now that work again is the responsibility of the property owners. The city is only gonna be constructing to the property line. So project timeline, as Randy said, we're very early in the design phase. Um, part of the process as we move forward is gonna be working closely with every one of you to make sure that We've got the lateral in the proper location, so it's gonna work for you in the future. Um, we also wanna get some information on the elevation of your lateral coming out of your house. So we can do everything we can to try to accommodate a gravity flow from your home to the street. Now, currently, we are expecting that some homeowners are gonna be um, required to put in individual lift stations just because your property sits so much uh, below the street elevation. And we've kind of got an idea, you can see these properties on these boards that are identified in orange. Those are the homes that we expect will likely require an individual lift station. But again, that can't be confirmed until we do more investigation and, and find out exactly where your lateral is at, what's the elevation, and see if we can accommodate that the best we can. So after that phase, after the public outreach, meeting with all of you, entering your property, and we do have um, access permission forms over here on the table. And what that is, it's basically saying, yeah, we'll give you uh, permission to come on our property, do some survey work. There will be no disturbance. It's just uh, investigative work. Um, if you have any special you know, requests for times, um, other special considerations for that, you can write those down in the forms. 
Um, so anyways, if we ask that you can take one of those forms, if you're happy to fill it out tonight, leave it here, or um, take it home with you, read it over, think about it, and then send it in to Darren. His contact information is on that form. So after we get through the preliminary design phase, we'll go into final design. Essentially what that means is we take the information we learned during the preliminary design and we put it together into a bid package for contractors to bid for construction. So that's expected to be complete in May of next year and then start a construction in September. Now that again is just gonna be for that first phase and not all phases. And then um, as far as construction completion, we expect that to be done in uh, less than 12 months. So by summer of 24, project complete. Now what to expect? I kind of already talked about a lot of these. Uh, we're going to reach out to UGIA, uh, coordinate, um, you know, uh, preliminary design uh, investigative work. Uh, we'll have a surveyor and a design representative um, on the property to get the data that we need. And uh, we intend to communicate with you closely, whether it's by phone call, email, whatever you prefer, to coordinate those meetings. Make sure that uh, we're all on the same page. And then um, after that process, uh, you can expect a notification of the construction timeline. So as we get closer to bidding the project, um, we'll send out a notification saying this is a go, this is when the project's expected to happen, and um, you know the approximate schedule for that uh, construction. And then there will be road closures during construction, and um, you know we'll get that worked out with the contractor. Generally, the contractor gives us his plan on how he's going to control traffic during construction. Um, but we have a general idea on detour routes and things like that, that as part of our scope, we'll work with the city to kind of figure out what's the best detour routes, and then we put that in the contract document so the contractor tries to build around those requirements <coughs> for traffic control. Then, um, after the project's complete, the city will send a notification to all property owners saying that the project's complete and you have service available at your property. Now, there's been some frequently asked questions. Do you want to take this, Randy? Okay. I'm going to hand it back to Randy. Thank you. Thank you. So, oh, sorry. Uh, a couple of things to talk about here, primarily related to cost, um, how, how your role in this, this system will play out. Uh, connection is, re is recommended but not required. So that was one concern that we heard early on is a lot of folks have had concerns about why well, just fix my septic system or my septic system is working fine. So we heard the message loud and clear. Um, we're gonna basically make it recommended. So whenever your septic system fails or requires major modification, that will be the time that you would then have to upgrade into the city services with the exception being if you are required to pump, uh, there is a municipal exemption for that. Uh, if you were a single family home and you have to pump to a uh, municipal sewer, you would be exempt from those requirements. Um, we talk about down at the bottom, we're trying to limit as many individual pumping stations as we can. Uh, we totally understand some people's hesitation to want to adopt lift stations. They can be uh, challenging in a number of situations, especially if you have a loss of power, right? What do you do with that? Um, you can add battery backups, but again, those, those can be more cost added to your system. And so we're going to look at this design. Um, I appreciate talking to a number of you after this meeting. There are some uh, exhibits over here, uh, in my, if you can see my green pointer here on the right. So these two exhibits have a number of proposed alternatives. Those alternatives essentially would be uh, requesting and obtaining an easement from adjacent property owners that would allow you to limit lift stations on your home. So if you have a home in these orange areas and you don't want to include an individual lift station, Let's talk afterwards and let's see if we can come up with a plan to get an easement between you and your neighbor's parcels so that we can get a gravity system in the, the, the pumping system. 
Uh, again, those conversations can be difficult. Many neighbors may not want an easement across their property, uh, but th that is an option. So we're, we're certainly open to those conversations. If you would like to uh, facilitate those with us, we're happy to hold them. Uh, but again, if you want to look at these exhibits here, the blue and the red line shown here would be an altern a potential alternative. Again, as Keith mentioned, this is all very preliminary. We have to get in the backyards. We have to do some investigative work to ensure that these are feasible. If we can confirm they are feasible, again, it opens the door to different solutions to our sewer problems. So total cost. So the first one would be to construct the sewer lateral from your residence to the point of connection. Keith mentioned, and I believe in your, in your brochures that you received at your home, we are going to be constructing a main in the road and a lateral to your property line. The conversation on where that lateral ends up on your property line is up to you. So we appreciate that you might have mature landscaping, you may have water features, irrigation, uh, gas, electric. We understand you have you know, complex properties that have all kinds of infrastructure. Um, we want to limit that disturbance as much as possible. We're not here to make this hard on you. We want to work with you. So part of the next phase, as Keith mentioned, is for us to talk with you and understand what is on your property. Where should we be placing these, these pieces of infrastructure? And then, again, working with you to identify uh, the most ideal location. Can we ensure that we're going to miss everything and anything? No, it's just not feasible, right? We still have to make it work. It still has to drain by gravity, right? There are still things that have to happen to make this function. But again, we want to make sure that your, your needs are met and your, your concerns are voiced. You'll be required to abandon the septic tank. I'm still working on conversations with the health department, but in general, my understanding is that all you have to do is demolish the lid, fill it up with sand, um, and you have to get it back, excuse me, vacuumed out first and clean, and then um, essentially the abandonment of the septic is fairly inexpensive. You don't have to remove the whole thing from the property. Uh, but again, I'm working on those conversations with the health department, so as we get closer to that, I'll have more answers on what those are going to cost. Uh, I believe the permitting for that are fairly minimal in the order of magnitude of like less than 100 bucks. Um, so that should be a okay. And, yeah, and, and again, uh, Andy Hummel made a good point. We're, we're also looking at um, at waiving those fees as well for those first two years. So uh, we're going to work on every avenue we can to help make this easier. Uh, connection fees. So for the first two years after you receive a letter, oh, let me. I'll get to you. Uh, after the first two years after you receive the letter that the municipal sewer is available. You will have two years to connect to the municipal sewer, and we will waive any connection fees or permit fees associated with your ladder. So right now, the current fee is $4,729 to connect. That is just to pay for the city infrastructure to get it there. That is kind of your responsibility as the property owner. Every home built in Carson City has to pay into that connection fee. It's, that's typical of all single family residents um, and other uh, multifamily commercial. And then the typical monthly sewer charge that's posted on our website, we have a rate fee um, that you can look at online. But right now, the current monthly charge is forty-six dollars and sixty-three cents for, uh, for for municipal sewer service. All right, I think you have one quick question in the back. You said you were going to talk to the health department about the abandoning the sewer. Uh, I mean, the septic tank. Which uh, health department? The city, the state? The yeah, good, good question. So right now we're working with the, the city's health department, who is the one that's regulatory inside of uh, Carson City. And then, I don't know, Andy, did you want to add anything on? Okay, so, so Andy's saying the city is ultimately the regulator in that instance. Again, we've, we've brought a slew of staff here. We want to meet with you all and talk afterwards, and we can look at your, your specific property. We can kind of talk through if that's feasible, um, if there's easements required, or what the challenges are. Again, we're still very preliminary, so 
we may not have all of the answers because, we, again, we have to get into the backyards to survey to, to capture that data. Um, but if it is feasible, again, we're, we're open to those conversations. Okay, any more before we have, we only have like three or four more slides and then we'll open it up for questions. Last question. Do you have some mics? Yes. <laughs> Darren was trying, but we were just moving too fast. But yes, we will, we will have a mic, and I apologize. I probably should have repeated the question. Um, anyways. Okay, one more. Why, why did you guys decide on two years for the to, uh, uh, connection? That's a great question. Um, one that <clears throat> happened before my time here at the city. That was the, that's from the original resolution back in 1995. And so in, in an effort to be consistent and fair and transparent, we're kind of repeating that same resolution moving forward from the first nine phases. So if you couldn't hear the question, the question is, would we consider essentially a, a longer time? Um, and I think, again, that's a question for the Board of Supervisors, those that are elected to, uh, to represent you. Uh, I, we don't have really a dog in the fight, so to speak. I think, you know, my personal opinion is there has to be some limit, right, to encourage connections. Otherwise, the, the problem is going to proliferate longer and longer and longer. So um, point noted, I think there's certainly some conversations to be had here and uh, cer certainly empathetic to your, to your concerns. Okay, let me just, uh, I, know, I know we have a number of questions. We've got like three more slides. We'll get through those and then we'll open it up for general questions. Um, okay, I think we've talked about most of this already. Pumping stations, again, we're trying to limit them as much as possible. Um, we've talked about the alternatives for backyard sewer easements. And then um, residential brighter pumps, they have evolved. I know a lot of concerns I heard early on were pump stations stink, they're loud, they fail. Some of those are very true. Uh, some of the lift stations that aren't operating properly can, can do all of those things. Uh, my experience with the more modern version of those lift stations, they are significantly better. Um, so I think that's individual preference and research. There are some benefits to, to pump stations. If you do want to know what those are, I'm happy to talk about those. I'm going to go on and on and on about it. Uh, but again, we are trying to limit those as many as we can. Okay, project communication tools. So again, we've reached out to a number of you through mail. If you want to write down or we can give you um, some information afterwards. So this is me, I'm Randy Rice, I'm the city engineer. Again, Darren Anderson is our project manager. So you have email and contact information. And then Andy Hummel, who is our, our sewer, who is our utility manager. Uh, we also have a website. Darren, are we able to open that website really quick? Okay, I will let you know. Um, so we do have a website. I can't remember. Did we put that on the, the brochure? I don't think we had it available. Did we? Okay, so we didn't have it on the brochure that I can see. But we also have another way that you can reach out to us. So it's South E or S E Area Sewer. S E Area Sewer at Carson.org. So that was on your brochure. And that goes to a number of project members. So if one of us is on vacation or not available because we have other things going on, that goes out to our entire project <coughs> team. And they're monitoring that, um, sorry, we're monitoring that, that email all the time. And they're happy to get back to you as soon as we can. So I think a number of you have already conversed through that method. So that's, that's perfectly fine as well. <laughs> yes. So as you came in as well, there was a sign-in sheet. So if you would like to leave us your information, so we have it, um, that's all we'll use that information for. It's just so us, we can get a hold of you. If you call and you say, hi, my name's Tina, and you don't leave an email or a phone number, I don't know how to call you back and address your concerns, right? So please leave your information. Um, it's very helpful for us to, to get back to you in time. That's it. Sorry you had to sit here for so long. I hope I answered the majority of your questions. Um, let's maybe start on this side of the room. Darren, you can pass around the mic, and uh, we'll, we'll do our best to facilitate some questions. You mentioned that the uh, New Empire has this problem too. Have they? Have you done anything about New Empire? 
Yes, my understanding is that was completed before 2008. Yeah, yeah, back in the late 90s. And that area was is, uh, north of 50 and east of the freeway. <laughs> did, did the night lights go down? Is that approved? Yeah, that's... Nobody knows. Yeah. It's not that <laughs> Yeah, that area, we don't have a bunch of production wells in that area to, to see a bunch of and if they didn't shut the thing, uh, data, but yeah. what we do have shows that yes, that did solve the problem there. It solved it. I mean, it's, it's it not an issue. Yeah, cutting that source off. <laughs> and um, if we'll, we will be able to pump our septic tanks. I mean, that's not considered a failure if we have, just have to do routine pumping? No, that's just routine maintenance. And how about if we want to sell the house? Is this going to affect uh, the sale of the house? Does it have to be disclosed? That yes. uh, you have a se the have. septic tank would be disclosed. Yeah, yeah. And I would assume they would be the rule to want that on there. As part of the in the past, what they've done is if you sell the place, the new owner has to hook up. Uh, Darren, I think there was a couple more hands back over here. Where are uh, septic tanks permitted in uh, Carson? So anything over three acres uh, for where? new single-family homes is allowed. I said where, not where. Oh, geez. Uh, do you know where three-acre lots are? Where the three acres? Yeah. No. So they're not. I, there's there's a few. I know there's some uh, up west on 50 where the state property is. Um, out in that area, there's a number of large parcels that people will subdivide and, and turn those into larger larger lots. Uh, but a lot of this, again, that. That requirement is because we don't want dead septic areas um, contaminating groundwater. Septic systems do a pretty decent job of lowering nitrates, right? Some, some estimates are in the 75 to 85 percent. Usually when you flush your toilet, the numbers I've seen are between 60 and 80 um, milligrams per liter of nitrates coming out of the toilet. And by the time it leaches into the ground, you know, about 75 to 85 percent of that has been mitigated just through the process of leaching and settling out through the through the septic system. Uh, but again, if you have those in high concentrations located central to each other, that's where the problem is is predominant. The vector study used 350 gallons per day per resident. Can, can you talk into the mic, please? The vector study used 350 gallons of sewage a day in their study. And when you look here, most of us, probably our kids, are not living at the house anymore. <laughs> um, I looked at my uh, water bill in the uh, wintertime. We used, uh, what was it, uh, like 80 gallons a day. It's a big difference. I mean, if you guys are saying that uh, we're doing 350 gallons a day and there's only two people in the house, I think they're using bad data. Well, again, we're we're using data. We're using testing data. We're not yeah, using no, use, use, yeah. use us. Use us. We are we are using you. We're testing the well. Okay. The well is telling the story, right? We're not using theory. We're not using how many gallons. We're looking at what's coming out of the wells. That's that's what we're using. Okay, I think we have some questions. Yeah, Randy. Uh, my name's Colin Schiffer. I'm on the north end of Ethel Bay, and my neighbors are both here that are orange lots in our area. The original plot plan for pretty much everybody in here includes a permanent utility easement. Just want to make sure you're aware of that. Five feet on either sideline, five on the back, and seven and a half in the front. So that if you're going to run lines behind my house and my neighbor, for example, to accommodate my neighbor here, there is a 10 foot corridor, right? You guys are aware of that. I just so, want to make sure it doesn't slip through the cracks. The yes. other part is you're also going to be, in this case, going to Hudson to put a stub there for potentially a home or two instead of to the front of their house. So you've also considered that too, that if you allow somebody to have an easement through adjacent property owners that you are not paying for a stub to their front property line. You've also considered that, right? I'm not sure if I follow that second question. I will answer the first question. Okay. Um, so a PUE is not exclusive to your neighbors necessarily, right? And additionally, five feet is traditionally not enough for us to bring sewer across the lots, right? Five feet is really not even enough for us to construct the sewer, let alone to operate Isn't it and maintain. Ten. Five Isn't it ten? Ten. It's, it's usually 10 on both sides of the line. Okay, so you need 20 feet? 
more or less. Now again, it's depth dependent and it's also soil dependent, right? I don't, that's, we're kind of getting into the weeds there. Those are, those are for, I guess, a little more in-depth conversations. But depending on how the soil holds up when you dig into it, if it's going to collapse, we have to provide special construction techniques in order to facilitate the pipe. Um, and if we're talking about something that's three feet deep or five feet deep, that's a lot easier to facilitate than something that's 20 feet deep, which is what we have in some of our areas here. So again, um, there's also uh, implications of you draining your sewer across your neighbor's property. If we need more than five feet, which is likely, we're not able to guarantee that into perpetuity without some kind of legal recorded document. So if your neighbor decides to plug his, uh, his lateral and pump up to the street, you're in a situation now where you're, you're in a civil battle with your neighbor. So for us, it's much more desirable for us to have a conversation, uh, an agreement, a legal document that says, yes, we agree into perpetuity that this contract is binding. My, my neighbor is allowed to drain sewer through my property and not relying upon just a five foot you know, typical standard. <laughs> Hi, Scott Cisco. We've been emailing a lot. Um, <clears throat> just a couple things, first of all. Um, you, you, you made a statement earlier that it's up to us to take this to the city supervisors, and I don't really think you want to do that. So I think we need to get our concerns out to you, and hopefully you guys will take that to the city supervisors. First of all, we didn't create this problem. Ormsby County came in there, they wanted the subdivision, they wanted the taxes that were going to come from it, they permitted all of these. Carson City then merged with Ormsby County. Uh, hopefully again, they did their due diligence, found out not only what assets they were going to sweep in, but what liabilities and exposures they had. And then Carson City continued to write permits and inspect septic systems for prospective home buyers and gave us all a feel good that we were going to get something that we were going to have this very exact thing happen. So I think most of us, or a lot of us, our number one position is this is a, you know, this is a situation where the city should come in and take care of all of it, not just say this is that and that and that. However, in one of the letters that you wrote back to me, you used the word compromise. You said, well, it's a compromise that um, we're going to waive the, the hookup fee and we're going to cover this up to your property line. We're going to, well, compromise is something where multiple parties sit down and talk about it, and we all agree to something, not just one party telling the other party what they're going to do. But I do like the word compromise, and you guys have been much more open than what we, what we all went through in 2007 when we went through this process. Um, there's about three things that I've identified that I'd like to see you all take to the city supervisors. And I'm assuming you're going to have to get an updated resolution, because if you're going to make the voluntary, the resolution that's on file, doesn't make it voluntary. So I'm assuming you're going to go to them for an updated resolution. There's three things I'd like to see. I personally would like to see in a couple of my neighbors. One is the de definition of a septic system failure. It shouldn't be that we have to worry about just the fact that we just have to make some minor repairs or whatever else. The septic system failure that forces us into this situation should be a complete failure. Septic tank and the leach line both have to be eliminated, replaced, or whatever. That would be the definition I think that a lot of us you know, would, would like to see on that. Number two, and it was brought up a minute ago, is a time extension. Uh, again, we'd like, you to, we'd like to see you take it to the city, but we'd like to see five years where we still get those incentives, not just two. Uh, again, 100% right. All the contractors are right now, it's a seller's market, and we're going to have contractors come storming into our neighborhood and say, we can do this for you, but you only got two years, so you've got to take my price, and we've got to do it. They give us five years instead of two. And the third thing is, you said that there was no way that you could get any financial incentive really for us. Why not? Why not waive half of that monthly septic fee once we hook up? For a period, if we submit our construction bills that we had to pay to hook up, we submit them to the city, and for a period, uh, either up until it's either paid for, one, two, 10 years, we reach 10 years, or three, um, uh, the, the, the property transfers out of our family's ownership, one of those three things, and, and we get a, let's say, 50% credit on the sewer portion of our water and sewer bill to, to help reimburse us for those things. 
Those are the compromise. If we were sitting down at a table and we were negotiating, that's what I'd like to see in the compromise. Again, our number one position, my number one position, is on the county, or the city created this situation, and you're asking a very select group of people to pay for it, not not the whole city. The number two is if you you're hell bent on doing it, you're going to go forward on it. Give us something that's going to help make it a little more colorful for us, and gives gives us a little bit more time to start with this. Yeah, well, great, great comment. Um, so I think your first comment about the definition of septic failure, I don't know, Andy, is there one that's already available or is that something we can develop? The council is basically anything that require uh, either a new beach field or tank replacement would require a permit. Okay. But so, then we would ask that that be both, not not just one or the other. Because a leach field, I mean, again, somebody, when I moved into my house, at the, the guy with the back came over and was going to clear the back of our apartment, and he crushed the pipe that was coming out of the septic system, and I had to replace that. I wouldn't want something like that force me to, all of a sudden, I got $20,000 expense instead of a $400 care. <clears throat> yeah. No, it's a, it's a great comment. So um, I think that's something we can work on for sure. We can consider that, you know, how that works. The one thing I will say is, you know, sometimes a septic, a septic tank, because of its construction, they can last 50, 70, 80, 100 years, right? Uh, leach field typically only lasts, you know, 15 to 30 years because they get clogged up, roots, etc. And so, again, you know, you mentioned compromise. Our goal here is to eliminate the source of the nitrates, right? And to do it in the, the least disruptive way possible. And so again, we've, you know, you challenged us in, in your letters, and I do appreciate our, our, our long conversations we've had, but you challenged us in our letters to, to do something and, and to look at how we can make this, you know, more uh, attainable. And so that was one thing that we're gonna work on in that resolution was to go forward with uh, not requiring hooking up right of way, right? So again, I think we're, we're listening to those concerns. We're trying to make adjustments uh, in, you know, in our direction and how we, we uh, focus our, our time there. Um, and I, I apologize if I misspoke or maybe I wasn't clear. My expectation is not that this group goes and, and calls the, you know, the mayor and, and calls the board of supervisors. Yes, I agree that that's on us to, when we write that resolution, um, you know, we're going to have those thoughts and, and they're going to see this meeting and they're going to hear all of your concerns and, and based on what their desire is, of course, that's what we're going to, we're going to follow. And um, will, will you be willing to take the things that we propose today as Compromises to the city supervisor. Absolutely, yeah. I don't okay. feel like there's any reason why we can't share, you know, share what you you said today. You and brought up the thing earlier, the history of the two-year thing. Again, though, a lot of people made good points here in the fact that we're just coming out of COVID, we're just going into a big recession. Uh, like I say, contractors are way behind. Uh, again, we would that that's very important to us that we get five years instead of two to hook up because that is a financial cloud over our head. And when we sell our houses, we are going to have to tell the prospective home buyers that hey, just heads up, you may have a 20, 20, 20 dollars uh, expense coming your way any day now if if all of a sudden something happens. And if I was a home buyer, I would say well, then drop right to the house by twenty five thousand dollars. Yeah, no, understood. And uh, again, we'll, we'll, we'll consider those. And uh, if, if that's the, the will of the Board of Supervisors, they want to make that, that resolution uh, forward, then, then we have the problem. You know, again, that's, that's not really for us to, to take forward. We can only do what we have to do part of this project. Um, but again, we can, we can certainly bring those conversations forward to the Board, the City Management, and uh, see where that, that conversation goes. Um, and then you mentioned the, the partial waiver of the monthly, you said monthly septic, but I think you meant monthly sewer, the municipal sewer bill? Yeah, the sewer okay. portion of it. Yeah, and so again, those are just conversations we can bring forward and see what the appetite is of the board um, based on these conversations and see where they went. Well, and just so you know, that's not going to cover any of our costs, but it would be something to show that it truly was a partnership. It wasn't just this very small portion of homeowners being hit with the total bill to provide clean water to the entire city. Yeah, understood. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, I have the uh, uh, minutes from a uh, sewage and wastewater advisory committee meeting in Clark County where uh, the SNWA is in the process of developing a septic conversion pilot program which will provide septic users with a grant of up to 85% of connection costs. And I wondered if something like that is being addressed here. Yeah. So I think um, what we've described today is what we're 
able to do financially. Again, just like all of you standing here today, you have finite resources and your own abilities to pay for your lifestyle and what have you. Um, the city is, is no different, right? Otherwise, if we had infinite resources, we would you know, be doing all these all at once, right? So we have to plan for and stage the construction, the planning, the design of these projects just as you would if you had a home repair project, if you needed to fix your car, right? You have to plan to put money aside and then you know, when you have those unfortunate events when your car breaks down, hopefully you've, you've put enough money aside to fix those problems. It's the same for us, right? Our, our resources are stretched thin and so part of this discussion is, you know, we're, we're putting in a ton of money. We're talking the word of magnitude of, you know, three to five million dollars uh, to, to put these, these sewer mains into the road. Um, so again, adding, just adding this the laterals to the entire project would increase the project costs on the order of magnitude of about 40 to 60 percent, right, by our estimation. So it becomes right. unattainable, right, to, to do everything. Right, but that's not coming out of the city's pocket. That's coming out of the government. A, a portion of it is. The other portion is coming out of the sewer connection fees that the residents of Carson City put into it. So mm -hmm. the, out of the $5 million, that's, those are sewer enterprise funds mm -hmm. that are paid for by your monthly sewer bills and the connection fees that go and into so that. They so they've saved up some money, just like you told us, to save up for our car repairs to do extra project, projects that come along. We have to balance the way we spend that money across all project needs. We have, we have lift stations <laughs> ourselves throughout the city. We have sewer repairs that have to go on. So unfortunately, yes, we have to pick and choose where we spend that money. Yeah, several questions. Oh, I, he's got a microphone back there. Yeah. Chuck Lawrence, I have a, one question about it. We're, you've got all these figures and all what it's going to cost and what we're supposed to rely on. And uh, all the charges and if everything goes through, here's what you have to pay. And are you still going to be doing testing after this thing is done? Okay, if you're testing and it comes back that it wasn't fixed, but we went to all this money to do this, mm -hmm. we get a refund back on our taxes. This is a great point. There's only two people living on each acre. All of us, all of us live basically with two people on one acre. We're not creating the nitrates. Yeah. The prison is. There's more people yeah. in that prison than there is in our entire community. Oh, and the horses. So, and the cows. Uh, I, I like the way you think, and it's an interesting... Okay, guys, I can't hear five people talking, so I'll just we'll try, we'll do our best to stay civil here. I understand that some people are frustrated, and that's why we're here to have these conversations, right? So, sir, if you could just... If you could let me address this person here, that'd be great. So, um, no, I don't think there's any foreseeable way for us to do refunds. However, I will say that once the water is has the contamination is going into the aquifer, it takes sometimes 10, 20, 30 years for the, that water, that contamination to, to lower, right? But what we can tell is, is the curve flattening? Are the nitrates staying the same or lower than they were? And many of this, the situations we have, like at Well 9, when we look at that data, which is further up in the area, of the southeast area we've done previously with phases one through nine, those ones are staying flat and starting to trend downward. So you're not going to see a change overnight. This isn't something that you, you fix and then a, a light switch flips on and all of a sudden, you know, the, the numbers are, are different. Right? Trust me. Well, it's, not, it's not trust me, but these are, these are all engineering principles that, that take, it takes time to remediate, right? But you can't get to point B unless you start at point A, right? Um, I heard some concerns about the, the prison. So, the hydrogeology, we've talked about the subsurface water in this area, it's very complicated. Most of the water in Carson City flows from the west side to the east side. There's a, there's a knob, there's a hill that's right on the, uh, the eastern boundary here, uh, just east of Gentry Lane. And essentially what's happening from the engineering studies that we have, the water turns and goes east and south towards the river in this area. And so the septic areas in this area are draining towards the wells and towards the prison farm. So the, the prison impacts that you're referring to, we have data on those, and it's been proven that that's not, that's not the case. Is there some influence? Potentially, right? Again, this we're working on our best principles, industry practice today. We don't have future technology that can predict the future, right? We're doing the best that we can with what we have today, with today's technology, 
and the understanding and principles that we have today. And so we've vetted this information very carefully. We're not just doing this on a whim, right? We've taken this information and water flows towards the river, right? And so it's going south away from your property. So the properties where the septic systems are towards the wells and then towards the prison farm. The prison farm does not drain north towards the well sites. So I think you had some questions. And then Darren, it'd be, it'd be good to get some folks over here too. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 5285 Jim Riesel. I'll be in the first batch. My name is Ralph Thomas. I'm the guy that walks the burrows all over the neighborhood. It's your fault. It is. <laughs> Those poor burrows. Yeah, it goes in the green garbage cans every week. Um, I see this is being recorded. This is a public record. So the, the superintendents and the mayor will see all this. Um, good. The other thing, I was a little confused on the website. You say that it's not up and running? No, I'm sorry. What I was trying to say was we, we did not have the website up and running when these first shipped out, and now we do. Okay. Because so I think it'd be a good idea if you want to keep this out in the open for public. If we ask questions, those should be posted so the rest of us can see it, see what the responses, et cetera, are. And that should be, or should have input from the superintendents and the mayor also on all of this. Uh, that way we can keep track of what's going on and, and ask additional questions. Um, pump stations, I came from a community that was adjacent to a community that they put individual lift stations in for the whole town. It's called Glide, Oregon. About 10 years after they did that, they had more than a 50% failure. You mentioned that with technology maybe getting better, maybe getting better, maybe not. You just don't know what happens with that stuff until it, yeah, it happens. Those things are not very cheap. Part of my career, I worked in, in waste management and water treatment. So I understand the systems, and I understand what's happening here, and the rationale of why it's being done. I agree with the project that needs to be done. Um, but also, you know, financing is a big issue with a lot of folks. You know, I plan on getting this done as early as possible, but not everybody can do that. You know, if, if this is going to cost twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars, most people can't afford that. You know, where do you take out a loan to be able to do that to save the five thousand dollar hookup fee? I think the city needs to go back to the drawing board, like continue putting in for grants, bonds, etc. I'd rather pay a bond off $100 a month over 20 years or whatever than have to fork up, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars at one time. So I think folks need to start looking at that and get that in the middle if at all possible. Um, you mentioned neighbors getting together for this right-of-way stuff. This whole thing's a form of take. You know, in essence, it really is. You know, we're, we're this is going to happen to us no matter what. We're going to have to pay for it. And I'm not against the project at all. But you know, when you need right of ways, there's this thing, terrible thing called condemnation. You get public utilities in. You know, these are for public purposes and stuff. So whether you call it take or condemnation, that's another tool that can be used. And I know politically people don't like doing that. But sometimes, if you want this project to go forward, that may be the best way in the long run to alleviate those pump stations at the individual cost for those people that have to pay for those stations up front and pay for maintenance in the long run, and because they do fail. Um, trenching costs and stuff, I mentioned before, contractors and availability. If you're talking about 20, 25 foot trenches, you know, you can lay those trenches back to meet OSHA standards, but you're talking about a heck of a wide trench of that. Most of our landscaping can't take that kind of impact. So you're talking about contractors that need shoring. There's not a lot of those around this community. And I really want to emphasize, going back to the drawing board, forget that stuff that happened in, in the 90s. We need more time for this. You know, to, to bring in contractors here with large enough equipment that can dig deep enough with the shoring, um, that's specialty equipment. I don't know how much of that stuff's available in Reno, but I can probably almost guarantee there's probably only two, maybe three outfits here in town that have that. I don't even know if the city has that. We've probably got some short, but not a lot. And that's about it for me. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think you mentioned a number of those uh, previously, but yeah, thanks for the great comments. Yeah, I really appreciate your point of view. Okay, Darren, uh, can we get some folks over here? I think there's been some patient people over here. With you. I live on the downside of Gentry. We would be required to have a lift station 
Has anybody considered putting another line in the gully behind all of our houses? Yeah, and again, that I, I don't know exactly which home, and we can talk again about specific properties afterwards, and that's kind of what we're here to do tonight. Um, but we're, we're open to those conversations. If it works, if it doesn't obstruct your drainage, and we can make that happen, those are certainly things we consider. Okay. Anybody else? I'm just curious what the current level of the well is. You keep talking about um, nitrates being at 10, but what is it actually currently at? <laughs> so I uh, was at 14. So well 38, which is the one um, closer to Snyder, that one is in the, the 14 to 16 milligrams per liter range. Uh, my recollection is you have to pump that well for over a month, 24 hours a day, uh, which results in tens of thousands of gallons of water wasted uh, in order to get the threshold of that below uh, the five, uh, which, is, which is the threshold for additional testing. And that's our drinking water for this community? It, it does go into your drinking water supply. Um, and one other question. You have a fixed budget, um, and when you put this out to bid for contractors to um, do the work, what if they come in overbid? Does that mean the project is canceled? It may. It depends on um, where, where that funding situation lies. If we're successful in obtaining any more additional grant funding, um, it may just be delaying other projects to, to you know, fit, this, fit this one in, delaying this project a year or two until we can get the additional funding we need uh, through the budgetary process. So it, there's no one right answer. It's just, it, it just depends on where we land with that and how, how we can make that function. Hi, Richard Stokes. I live at 4411 Gentry Lane. Lived up in that area for going on 20 years, 21. And uh, when the sewer project was taking shape uh, on Conti and in our general area, I had heard from folks, probably nobody that has your credentials, that one of the reasons or one of the difficulties that they ran into in that area were underground, underground granite walls. Can you just tell us whether or not uh, any of these projects are going to be slowed down because of underground uh, structures that may or may not impact the project? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Thank you. Um, so we have done some preliminary investigative work, uh, which is called geotechnical investigation, which uses uh, invasive drilling to get into the ground and determine what is beneath the roadway. Uh, what we have found is the the ground or the bedrock below the ground um, is quite deep in the area of 20 plus feet in the areas that the project will be uh, located in. There is, uh, a, I think it's a granite seam, if I recall correctly, uh, Keith, correct me if I'm wrong, um, of rock that goes into the, let me see if I can pull up the map here. <coughs> so there is, there is kind of a rock seam that cuts on the back half of Heidi this way. Uh, so if we were digging in the backyards of Heidi, we might run into some shallower bedrock in the two to six foot depth range from, from what I'm remembering. Um, but, but in these areas, no, we did not find any very near surface. Okay, um, a couple more questions? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, just, oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Okay, we'll come back to you. I just wanted to address that issue. 45 years ago when our house was built, uh, we were told that that rock bed made our septic tanks more, uh, lo had long, longer time to live because that, the leach lines had a lot of rock to go through before they were ever going to get to the water. And we were also led to believe that the, the knob you're talking about, the pump over that ridge, was not feasibly possible. Now. The water mixing issue where all the pipelines came through from Minden up through Carson all the way out to Empire, that was supposed to be a clean water mix. Can you describe that to us a little bit? Because why can't the wells be moved? And is that a silly question? <laughs> it's not a silly question, um, but the answer is very complicated. <laughs> um, probably not something that we all 
we'll have time to sit through tonight. But um, can wealth be moved? Yes. Is it cheap? No. <laughs> um, it, you know, a single well can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, especially municipal wells that have to drill deep and get through rock structures, right? The more rock there is, uh, the, the longer it takes to drill, which you have more man hours and equipment out there, right? So it just drives the cost up, up right? Um, is this a good area for production of water? Yes, it is, right? This, there's, there's an abundance of water in this area, and that is why the wells were selected in this area to, to draw the water. Of course, you know, we're looking out for your best interest, and the reason why one of these wells has been turned off, because it does exceed the threshold, and it does increase the amount of staff resources to keep that well online. So that's that, why that well has been shut off. So I want everyone here to, to you know, rest very well tonight you know the water that you're getting is not contaminated it's below the threshold but what do we have to do to get there we have to blend the water right we have to use a more pure source with the sources we have in the area to achieve the regulatory goals right so is it safe to drink absolutely but we wanted to continue that trend we want it to continue to be safe we want to continue to serve you good water and you know into perpetuity and forever so um this is this is an important project for us to continue to ensure that we can achieve that Okay. Can the city provide a list of the licensed contractors in the area that are going to have the capabilities to either reduce, uh, uh, yeah. reroute the plumbing, to reverse the plumbing, have the ability with the uh, with trench plates and um, also with um, trench protection? and the equipment to do that, is the city going to be able to generate a list of contractors that can be made available that, that we can call? So we're not calling Joe's Plumbing down the street, and he says he can do it real cheap, but he has no way to work that deep in the trench. And I'm looking at probably 20 feet deep for my hookup attachment, so I'm not going in that trench. So um, traditionally, the city does not recommend or provide lists of contractors. Um, as you can imagine, if things go wrong, if one person gets all the work, then the city can be looked at as well. The city said, this is the guy, right? This is the person, this is the list. So traditionally, we don't do that. Uh, in this case, could we, could we try to do some, some um, reaching out and some outreach to see you know, who's out there and what could be done? I think that might be feasible. Um, I, I have to think about the, the appropriate way to do that. Um, so, so let me give that some thought. I don't want to say yes, but I'm not saying no. Brandon, let me let me okay, jump in there. Ahead. In our in our previous phases that we've done, the the cheapest and uh, most efficient projects that property owners did is when they work directly with the city's contractor because they're already out there on site building the job. And so we, we put the property owner in contact with the project manager of the, of the contractor that's out there. And because they're on site, because they're already mobilized, they, in, up to, to date, on all these other phases, they were able to give much better prices to the homeowners to do the work because they're already there. Okay, and what were the limits of their construction at that point? I understand you're saying that they were able to come onto the property and, and maybe run that lateral up to the house. But in my case, where I'm probably looking at reversing the plumbing under the house, are they going to be able, are they going to call underneath my house and reverse the plumbing, or am I still going to have to find another plumber to complete that? So, my recollection is, in previous phases, it was it was both one one of the contractors. I was I was here for two of the previous phases. One of the contractors just did the heavy uh laterals to up to the house and then stopped and the homeowners had to get a more um everyday plumber to do the work under the house the other previous contractor he had in-house capabilities where he could do the whole thing okay. so it would kind of depend on who actually ends up winning this project but that information of that contractor will be provided to the homeowners and a contact information they're, they're always looking for additional work to do, and like I say, while they're already out there, right in front of your house, that's the convenient time to do it. Okay, one, a couple more. One last thing about what Ralph said about trenching and shoring, and given the choice, you, again, you guys just wanna make sure you're considering, if you have to put an 18 or 20 foot trench in the street, but if you had the ability to put it behind some of the properties like the gentry people and do a six foot trench there and an eight foot trench in the street, 
that should be considered. I know Far West probably looks at that when they come out, but it saves everybody money. You don't have to shore in the street, and you don't have to dig as deep, or you're digging a shallower trench behind the properties that need it. So just want to mention that. Don't yep. forget that, too. It's on the radar. Thank you. Here. Yeah, just another quick question on access. You mentioned the roads will be closed. I'm assuming there will be detours and plates to drive over for the driveways and stuff because a lot of us aren't young anymore. There's a lot of people in the neighborhood that have medical problems and just want to make sure emergency services can get to those residences and such. I haven't asked Darren, but he promises to make sure that all of our emergency services are aware of what we're doing. That is typical um, MO for us at Public Works. All of, you know, trash, uh, emergency fire, they, they all know what's going on with our projects. We stay up to date with them all the time. So yes, they will be well informed. Um, any access, you know, you may, will you have a delay potentially, right? That you might have to wait a few minutes for a trench plate to be moved in uh, if you have to get out immediately, right? So um, there, there are times where there might be some inconveniences, yes. But in general, you will always have access to your property. You know, we're not gonna block you off and make you walk, uh, you know, two miles down the street to your house. We will do whatever we can to make sure you have safe and efficient access to your property. Okay. Uh, I appreciate the complexities of getting all this planned and funding and all, but if you're, the city's taking a soft approach where, um, you know, you're not going to force people to hook up to the, to the new sewer and you're giving an exemption for people who have to have a lift station, that a priority should be um, getting gravity sewer by those lots closest to the well. And I don't see that reflected in these 15% plans. So you're saying that the lot's closest to well being on gravity? <clears throat> yes, if you're not going to force people, I mean, it's logical that if you're trying to limit pollution to the well, that you would look at the closest ones first to try to encourage them to hook up and get, making them pump uphill. Who you know, on earth is going to do that? Uh, but, so it seems like, you know, a gravity, um, gravity system near those closest lots should be a priority. Agreed, and if we can get uh, you know resident buy-in on some of those alternative easements, that would be a preferred avenue for us to go. So we're we're considering those avenues as well. So uh, Andy, I think the gentleman's name was talking about the data and so on and so forth. Uh, where can we find this data? Where is it transparent? Where can we uh, go to locate the studies in which you are doing on a monthly, regularly basis that you've discussed? So right now on our website, the one we created for this project, um, we have a number of those studies already posted. Um, Far West has summarized that well data for you already, and that's online available well for you now. Uh, does it include the studies from New Empire dating back to the 90s? Um, yeah, we do. I, I believe we do have a vector study from the 90s. And my last question is, uh, one of the items that you had talked about was the uh, flushing of the systems to uh, minimize the nitrate concentrates. Something the Carson City has looked at in the past, I'm not sure why it didn't go anywhere, was to do uh, linear series uh, centrifuges to pull out the nitrates versus trying to dilute them. So we did look at that. Um, there is treatment and that study that Far West has performed is on, online as well. So you're welcome to go and read that. Um, my recollection was that that was cost prohibitive or it was, it was basically more expensive than the current option proposed. We look at not only capital projects, but also, uh, excuse me, capital expenditures, but also operational expenditures. And so while it may have a, a cheaper upfront cost, we also look at long-term costs, staff resources, how much does it cost to you know, buy chemicals, you know, maintain the centrifuges, you know, whatever treatment process we have in place. Um, and so this was the recommended alternative was to go with the gravity ascension system. Into this project, you have figured um, paving our whole streets or patching because uh, there's a street that we all travel down Vinick that we have been suffering through for the last 10 years because it's patched and not paved and we haven't had paving up there for 45 years. So all of our streets need a full paving and is this in the budget? So the, the short answer to that is no, unfortunately. Um, there's, a more, there's a more complex conversation to be had around there. Um, we don't have a local funding source for local roads. Um, if you've lived in Carson for a number of years, 
Um, it's, it's a bigger problem that we're tackling. Unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you tonight, um, but there is another website we've developed. Um, Darren, do you recall what that website is that, that talks about the funding on local roads? Preserve our roads. Uh, PreserveCarsonCityRoads.com. So PreserveCarsonCityRoads.com. Do our property taxes go to the roads? No. Why not? That's the Where do they go? They go to emergency services, sheriff, fire. So no roads. So um, if, I hope hope everyone heard the, the message of the website. But um, if you're if you're interested in understanding more about the complex nature of the local road funding, if that is something we're working on, we just don't have an answer right now on what that funding source looks like. You know where we draw the money in to do that. Um, with this project, we will pave whatever is required to put the road back in good shape to facilitate the installation of the sewer. But it will not be a full pave of the road. A few years ago, the city came before this very community to talk about the city-owned property on Bennett, which you have on in Zone B. And the, the city had the proposal at the time of subdividing that, that property. And, uh, you know, it, the concern I have is that that's going to be a so, you, know, you have a well there, and uh, we never got a full resolution of what the status is of that property. Is it still owned by the city? Is it still considered to be part BLM or park? Uh, you know, and how does that affect the proposed sewer? So my understanding is it is owned by Carson City as to the mechanism at which it was delivered to us. I'm not aware. I don't know, Darren, if you BLM. Are. BLM. So it's a BLM. So it's a lands bill. BLM open space. So it's, it's BLM open space. Um, how is it being factored into this project? We are looking at uh, maybe acquiring easements through that property to facilitate uh, some, some of the alternatives, some of the uh, pumping solutions or, or mitigating of the pumping solutions. We are looking at using our property to, to help with some of that. So we're, we're kind of trying to share in that responsibility as well. My understanding is this person city is in the process of returning that to BLM. They're trying to. They're trying to. That's, that's what came out of the meeting. It was to turn it back to BLM because of the open space and the undeveloped yeah, unfortunately, I'm not prepared to speak on that. I apologize. Yeah, I can speak on my retired from BLM. Um, yeah, that was acquired from a lands bill, but it was for recreation public purposes, the, the original intent of the land. And that was the reason the city wanted to give it back to BLM so BLM could put it up for disposal and possibly sell it to a contractor that would develop it. And then the city was going to ask for the funding from those sales to go back into the city coffers. I believe that was the gist of the project. So again, it just goes to show you the complex nature of these projects, right? Sometimes moving targets. Um, so that's something we will definitely, thank you for bringing it to our attention. I will, I will definitely look into that and see where that conversation goes. So there's another project going on behind um, our property on Gentry and on the BLM side to put in um, a bike path, an ADA bike path, which is costing quite a bit of money. And I'm wondering, you know, that's a recreational purpose. Why that money that's going to put in a bike path wouldn't be used to help the homeowners in this area to solve the problem? So I, I don't know the, the funding sources for that project, but the sewer, uh, the, the sewer funding comes from what's called an enterprise fund. That means it's funded by the bills, the utilities we collect through the monthly sewer bill, the collection fees, any developer uh, impact fees that come into the system. And you can't use sewer fees to fix you know, open space, or you can't use sewer fees to fix roads. Um, so it, it's a possibility that it's a limitation of the funding. Right? We can't just mix and match funding however we see fit. There are very specific rules that are guided by NRS and municipal code on how and when we can spend that money. And so there lies a lot of the limitations um, specifically for this project. So, I wish I had better news, but unfortunately, we, we have to work within the confines of what we've got. Okay. 
if, if you're the only couple of guys since you've, you've talked a number of times, I want, I know a lot of people probably are ready to go. I know a lot of people here probably want to talk to us individually about their property, and I want to respect people's time here to be able to do that. Um, if you do have some more questions, um, if you just want to come talk to us, we're going to be here all night. We're happy to, to answer some of those questions. I was just going to tell you, the process through that was simple funding. Yeah. The, the pay for that was through, like, 2009 uh, NDAA Act, principally it's a federal budget for the military and everybody else. And that land was uh, given to Carson City, basically, for recreation and public purposes. And so the, the money that's paying for those bypass comes from Snipple also. They have to apply for it like a grant. And so it's really, it's federal funding from the sale of properties from BLM land down out of base. That's what's paying for that. So it's just different dollars. Yeah, thank you. So again, all these grants, they have very high and stringent requirements on what we can and can't use the money for. And they're very complex in meeting all of the goals of those projects. There are matching money that has to go in. In other words, our enterprise funds have to use local money in order to match those grant funds. So it, it definitely becomes a tax to, to juggle those problems. Um, so again, unfortunately, those, those would not apply to this project. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone tonight. Um, I appreciate that this is a difficult conversation that's not lost on staff up here. Um, I realize that some of you may be excited, some of you may be frustrated. All those emotions are completely fine. We're going to stick around here to converse with anyone and everyone that wants to. Um, you're welcome to head out after that. Um, again, please leave your contact information if you want us to follow up with you. Please leave the information and let us know so, and we're happy to, to email or call you back. If you have any questions on our contact information, I'll bring that back up one more time. So if you didn't get a chance to write that down or take a picture or what have you, um, we'll leave that up here. We're always around, so please don't be afraid. Um, I know we don't always have the answer that you want to hear, but we're doing our best to, to make this as easy as possible. Okay, go ahead. For all the zones. Now, I disagree with the little red spot. So, I don't know if I have a great answer for you, but we're looking probably in the next five to 10 year horizon. It depends a lot on um, you know, getting the project designed. Again, I talked about the grants earlier. A lot of them like having shovel-ready projects. So, if we get these designs ready and shovel-ready, it's possible we could acquire or get the grant uh, application through. We're gonna continue working with our grant partners to see what other monies might be out there available for us. Um, so, it will largely depend on you know, budgeting of this and also where the grants become available. Is there anybody from the Board of Supervisors here? I'm sorry? Is there anybody from the Board of Supervisors here? I do not I, yeah, I'm missing one in the back. <laughs> in All right, thank you everyone for your time. I really do appreciate it. Come talk to us if you'd like to learn more. I see you, man. It's nice that you're in my neighborhood.